Well, thanks again, uh, Brother Steve. Brethren and sisters, we're now going to be focusing on the, the second portion of the title, Sincerity and Truth. And the next two studies, God willing, are going to be on that particular matter. Which means, of course, we have actually shifted uh, the program around. The, the, the study for tomorrow morning is now going to be the one we do this afternoon. I've done that for a couple of reasons. One is that I know that some of you, of course, aren't going to be here tomorrow. And I really would like to focus on the sincerity and truth. And when we get to John chapter 4, we're going to see just how wonderful that phrase is in a, in a context that's built on what we'll be considering in this study here uh, uh, in this second s- session. So then, Joshua brings all Israel just before he dies to Shechem. How important is Shechem in the scheme of things? I'd like you to come with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 12, while we're talking about the meaning of the name Shechem. It refers to the neck, that is the neck between the shoulders, the place where you put a yoke to bear a burden. But if you have a look, actually, this is from the east. This is Mount Gerizim over here. It's called the Mount of Blessing uh, in the scripture. So you've got Mount Gerizim to the south of Shechem, which is in the middle here, the, the town of Shechem. And you've got Mount Ebal, which means bear or bald, uh, because it doesn't have any trees on it, a bit like my scalp, it doesn't have much on it. It's bear and bald. And it's the Mount of Cursing in Joshua chapter 8, verses 33, 34, whereas Gerizim is the Mount of Blessing. We read in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 29. And we're going to see just how important this blessing and cursing is when we come to Joshua chapter 24. So you've got this idea... It's almost if you if you're standing above a man and looking down his back, you can almost see this is like the shoulders. You know, he's got that that sense. So Shechem means shoulder or the place where you you lie the burden on the neck between the shoulders. So it's very very important place. And of course, historically, it's all through the scripture. Its history, of course, is pretty well known amongst us. Now that's why I've asked you to come to Genesis 12 because this is the very first place that Abraham comes to in the land. He might have been to other places, we're not told. He had a a large company with him, but we're told that he came to Shechem as the first place in Genesis chapter 12. And there was something, something else there at this place, Shechem, which we read of in that record. So back in Genesis 12 and at verses 6 and 7, this is what we read. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of, says Sikkim in the King James, should be Shechem, the place of Shechem, and it says unto the plain of Moray. Now that word plain is the Hebrew word alam. It means the oak, the oak of Moray. Now Moray has the idea of a teacher, an archer, or someone who points you in a certain direction. So he's brought to an oak tree, which of course is the symbol of strength and durability in the word of God, He's brought to this place uh, that's going to teach him something. Now, what is it that's happening here? Well, he has to make some choices because it says, if you just step back to verse 5, I'm going to read the the latter portion of verse 5, and you'll see the emphasis here. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the oak of the teacher, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Well, of course the Canaanite's in the land. If at the end of verse 5 they came to the land of Canaan, what are you going to find there? Well, Canaanites. You see the point being made here, brothers and sisters? When one comes into the truth, like Abraham was the crosser over, yeah, you've got to go out amongst Canaanites, don't you? You're going to be amongst Canaanites. In your workplace, in the schoolyard, wherever it might be, you're going to be amongst Canaanites. They're in the land. They're unavoidable. So you've got to make choices, don't you? You've got to make choices as to what you are going to do. And that means you're you're choosing to accept responsibility, to bear certain burdens. And we know that they do take some bearing, don't they? And you've got to make choices that that's what you're going to do. This is what this place represents in the word of God. Wherever you find Shechem, that's what happens. People have to make choices to bear responsibility. So you've got Abraham starting that message off. So come along to Genesis 34 and 35. We're not going to do too much work on this, but you're familiar with the context. 
This is where Jacob brings his family to Shechem. And guess what? There are Canaanites in the land. And one of them, the prince of the town, defiles his only daughter, Dinah. You know the story, don't you? And when they make some uh, agreement with the men of this place, then along come Simeon and Levi and butcher all the men of Shechem when they're sore after circumcision. And then they rifle their houses. We know that, says in verse 29 of Genesis 34, and they spoiled even all that was in the house, including the teraphim, the false gods of the Canaanites. So when you get to chapter 35, you read this in verse 1. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that's where Abraham went after Shechem, that appeared unto thee, when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Yeah, you see, they'd rifled the houses of the, of the people of Shechem. They'd taken everything. All of the gods of, of Shechem were now in their possession. He says, we're not having them in my family. So what do they do with them? Well, we read on. and goes. We come down to verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Isn't that interesting? I think it might be the same oak that Abraham came to when he came to Shechem. So they buried these gods under an oak at Shechem. Decisions had to be made to separate themselves from the things of the Canaanites that they'd taken out of that town. Now, I think you might remember the words that were read in Joshua 24 that Joshua said to Israel, put away the strange gods from among you. Yeah, it comes straight from here. This is where Joshua brought Israel to challenge them as to which God they'd be serving. All right? And the very same words that Jacob spoke to his family are spoken by Joshua in Joshua chapter 24. You know, when you come to, to Joshua chapter 8, you read that when, when they had destroyed the king of Ai and his city, so let's come to Joshua chapter 8, something very unusual happens. I find this very curious. Joshua chapter 8, you read of the overthrow of the of Ai and its king. Verse 28, it says, And Joshua burnt Ai and made it in heap forever, and a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree, and so on. And you got down the record, and they, they made a great heap of stones at the gate that remained to this day, it says at the end of verse 29. And then, all of a sudden, out of the blue, in verse 30, then Joshua built an altar unto Yahweh, God of Israel, in Mount Ebal. Now, Mount Ebal's the northern mountain in Shechem. Hang on. What's happened here? The whole nation is down on the plain of Jordan. They're at Gilgal. An army has gone up under Joshua's leadership. They destroy Ai. Well, obviously, they're going to go home, aren't they? So they go back to Gilgal. But then the next thing you read is that they're at Shechem. This means that two million people They've got to up stakes, pull up their tent pegs, pack up, the, pack the gear, and get on the road for a, what would be a two-day journey from Gilgal to Shechem. It's quite a distance, even by car, I can tell you. Now they were all there. You notice what it says in verse thirty-five. It says there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congr congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones, and the strangers that were conversant among them, the whole nation was taken to Shechem. Now this was to fulfil, of course, God's requirement. And his requirement was that when they came into that land, they were to go to Shechem. And so as soon as they had the victory over Ai, they went back to the camp at Gilgal, picked up everything, and went up to Shechem. Half the nation stood on one mountain and half on the other, and they shouted the blessings and the cursings of the law across that valley. And they said, yes, amen, to all the blessings and cursings. Remarkable, isn't it? Remarkable event. Why did he take him to Shechem? Well, because that's where you make decisions to accept responsibility. All right, That's why. This is where you're going to shoulder the burdens of the truth. So, brothers and sisters, when you look at Shechem, it's highly significant. It was also, of course, appointed a city of refuge in Joshua 21, and verse 21. 
Now just a quick word about the other references that here. We're going to go, we might get time to go to Judges chapter 9 because remarkable events have happened at Shechem in Judges 9 and we're not going to get time to go to 1 Kings 12 verse 1 because you see it says on the death, on the death of Solomon all Israel went to Shechem to anoint a new king and this is where Jeroboam rose up and they questioned uh, Rehoboam and of course he made a mess of it and the kingdom was divided. So it was at Shechem that that happened. And of course, in our next study, God willing, after lunch, we're going to have a look at John chapter 4, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes to Shechem and converts the woman of Samaria. And we're going to see that all of that has its background here, back in, the, in Genesis and in Joshua chapter 24. So we might press on then. We might come to Joshua 24. I want to show you how blessing and cursing comes through this chapter. This is based on the promises made to Abraham. And we're going to see this blessing and cursing. You know what God said to Abraham? You know, leave your, leave your, your country and your kindred and your father's house and go to a land that I will show thee and I will bless thee. And he goes on to say, and those that bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. So what is meant when God said to Abraham, I will bless you? Now, of course, in our world today, if you say that someone's going to get blessed, your mind gets a picture of going down to the local Catholic church and they sprinkle whatever on you. You know, that kind of blessing. No, no, no. You see this quotation here from Acts chapter 3? This, this is essential to understand what is meant by the Abrahamic blessing. Peter has been speaking to the Jews on that day and many of them are converted. And he quotes from Genesis 22, that in thy seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then he explains what that means. He says, unto you the Jews first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Now, what's the blessing? Well, he tells you what the blessing is in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In other words, to be blessed in Abraham means to have your life turned around by divine intervention through the word. It means to be converted. It means to have the way you think changed. Yeah, so that you can walk in a right path and leave your iniquities behind. Yeah, God's at work. He's blessing you. So we are blessed with faithful Abraham if we're cooperating with God, letting him work in our lives through his word. That's where you get a divine blessing. So when you come to Joshua 24, you're going to see that this is based upon what God promised to Abraham. And we want to go through this and just follow this theme of blessing and cursing. Now, of course, this is Joshua chapter 8 being revisited, isn't it? Israel had been here in the days of Joshua Uh, when he brought them into the land, they're now back here when he's about to die for his final message to them. And he recounts their history. If you have a look at Joshua 24, verse 3, you read this. And I I want you to notice how often the personal pronoun occurs. Joshua is speaking, as we're told in verse 2, on behalf of God himself. Because it says in verse 2, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel. So Joshua is speaking on behalf of God. And the personal pronoun that you read in verse 3, and I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, that personal pronoun occurs 17 times in this context. 17 to a Hebrew meant absolute completion. It's 10 plus 7. Absolute fullness and completion. 17 times he says, I did this and I gave you this and I did this. Yes, it's God's work in the lives of his people. So in verse 3 he reminds them, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. Yeah, so there's a blessing. Israel was blessed. And, of course, Canaan was cursed because he says, I I led them throughout all the land of Canaan. So Canaan was given to Israel. So blessing to Israel, curse on Cain, just like Genesis 9.25 said there would be. Look at verse 5. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt. So there's a curse. I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. So there's the divine blessing. Plague Egypt, bring them out. Blessing, cursing. In verse 7, we read, 
that when they cried unto Yahweh, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. So he gave light to Israel, blessing. He gave darkness to the Egyptians, blessing, cursing. In verse 8, we read, I brought you into the land of the Amorites. In other words, he delivered their enemies into their hand and he destroyed, he says at the end of verse 8, I destroyed them from before you. So blessing to Israel, cursing to the Amorites. Look at verses 9 and 10. And Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. Yes, he tried to curse Israel. He was hired to do so. But what did God do? Verse 10. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still. Blessing, cursing. And it goes on like that, brethren and sisters. Verses 12 and 13. Israel was given a land without labour that was supposed to be a blessing. The Amorites were driven out by the hornet, which is a reference, of course, to the Spirit of God working through the angels who defeated the Canaanites uh, for Israel. In verse 20 of this chapter, you read this. If you forsake Yahweh and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt. That's a curse. And consume you after that he hath done you good. Yeah, blessing, cursing. You got the idea? The whole chapter introduces this demand by Joshua, put away the strange gods from among you. It introduces the history of Israel showing how God blessed and he cursed. He blessed if people cooperated. He cursed, of course, when they didn't. I want to come then to, to verse 14 of Joshua 24. Having reminded them of all the things that God had done for them, blessing and cursing, Verse 14, he says, Now therefore, so it's based upon what's gone before, Now therefore fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Now this, of course, is extremely important. This is why we've, we've selected the title out of 1 Corinthians 5. These are the words that Paul is quoting. He's going back to Joshua 24, picking up these words. We're going to find these words in places like Judges chapter 9 and in John chapter 4. They that come to the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's sincerity and truth. So they're very, very important in the scheme of things. So what is this word sincerity that we meet here? Well, as you can see on the screen, it is this word tami in the Hebrew. It means entire or complete. And the leading idea of the word is singleness, sincerity, and integrity. And you can find this word variously translated in the Old Testament. And there's the list of them. These, I'm not going to go through these, of course, but this is how this word, the same Hebrew word, is rendered by the English translators in the Old Testament. It's rendered as perfect of Noah. He was perfect in his generations before God. It is used uh, in, in Judges 9, it's sincerely, uh, it's rendered upright or uprightly in all of these passages. Uh, in, it's rendered undefiled in Psalm 119 verse 1. It's rendered without blemish 44 times in the law and without spot 6 times. So you, can, you get the idea of what this word means. Essentially, brothers and sisters, it's about sincerity. That's a pretty good translation. It's about sincerity. So... Joshua is calling upon Israel to serve their God in sincerity and in truth. Now the word truth, of course, is the word emeth. It's the word that God chooses of his own characteristic of truthfulness and faithfulness and loyalty to his own principles in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. He will never compromise his principles. He's always going to be faithful to them. And he wants that kind of loyalty in you and me. He wants sincerity and he wants loyalty to what's right. And that's, that's the essence of that word, emeth. So then, if this is the call, and we find, if you have a look at verse 23, you find this, it says, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, quoted straight from Genesis 35, verse 2, and incline your heart unto Yahweh God of Israel, that's the call that he gave Israel based upon this requirement to serve God in sincerity and truth. Now, they claimed they could. Joshua said, you can't, because I know what you've got in your homes, he said. I know what you've got. You've got all sorts of things. You've got false gods in your home. I know you can't serve Yahweh. And they said, but we will. He said, look, okay, you're witness against yourself, because I know what's going on in this nation. 
Right? As for me and my house, we've made up our minds where we're going to go. We will serve Yahweh. But I know what's going on in some of your houses. But then they say, well, oh no, we are going to serve God. You see what, what happens in verse 24? And the people said unto Joshua, Yahweh our God, will we serve? And his voice will we obey? So what's he going to do, do you think? He knows the problems they've got. What's he going to do? Well, essentially, brothers and sisters, he's going to have a memorial meeting. That's what he's going to do. He's going to have a memorial meeting so that they can examine themselves as to whether they be in the faith. Now, you might say, well, where, where's the memorial meeting here? Well, I want to show you. There's a memorial meeting here. And it's in Joshua 24, verse 25. It says, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. Now, this word made a covenant, or two words made a covenant, just happens to be two Hebrew words, kareth, bereth. Now, you all know bereth is the word in the Old Testament for covenant. It means to cut a covenant. Kareth means to cut. So when you put those two together, you've got cutting of the cutting of a covenant. Now, it's pretty intense. The first time that those two Hebrew words are put together is in Genesis chapter 15. In verses 9 and 10, 17 and 18, where we read that Abraham was to take three animals and one bird. He was to divide the animals down the middle, but not the bird. And you're saying, I thought there were two birds. No, there's only one. All right, we won't go to that now, but there's only one. So if you divide three animals down the middle and don't divide the bird, how many pieces you got? Seven. So you lay four on one side and three on the other. This is how they used to make covenants in those days, brothers and sisters. There's only one other place where you read about this, by the way. It's in Jeremiah chapter 34, where it talks about Israel in the days of Zedekiah making a covenant before God where they cut the calf in twain. Remember those words? They cut a calf in two and they passed between the pieces. So if you made a covenant in those times, just like Abraham made with Abimelech, remember, he brought out seven ewe lambs, yeah, they used to divide the animal and the two participants to the covenant would pass each other between the pieces. And as they passed, they would say, I promise, I covenant to do this. And if I don't keep it, then let me be like this animal that's been divided in two. So that's cutting of a covenant. Careth, bereth. It's not about exercise to look up where those words are used in the Old Testament. There's some fascinating things that will come out of that. So this is an, a very important phrase. When it says here in verse 25, so Joshua made a covenant, this is what it's about. It's about cutting a covenant. It's a very, very serious matter. So guess what Genesis 15 is about when you first meet this phrase? Brother Thomas tells you in Elpis Israel, Genesis 15 is about the sacrifice of Christ. All right, it's all about the sacrifice of Christ. So when Joshua cuts this covenant here, at Shechem, he's pointing forward. He's pointing forward to what you and I would be under. We would be in Christ as a result of his sacrifice and, and the confirmation of the covenants made unto the fathers. It's made over this divided sacrifice and there's the reference, Jeremiah 34, 18 and 19 that you can see. And we know, we know that the sacrifice of Genesis 15 was all about the, the offering up of our Lord Jesus Christ the covenant became a permanent ordinance. You see what it says in verse 25? And he set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Those Hebrew words got the idea of something very permanent and lasting. Just like the memorial feast is a permanent remembrance, an ordinance that we keep. And every time we keep it, we reflect upon the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Joshua is doing here for Israel. And it's made in the place of of decision and acceptance of responsibility. Just like the memorial meeting, it's the place where we once again renew our commitment to bear the responsibilities of the truth. So it's essentially what's happening here. But there's something else that happens here. Look at verse 26. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone. Now the word stone there is eben. It means a family building stone. It's used of the Lord Jesus Christ in Zechariah 3. He's the family building stone. It's the stone that was put to Moses to sit on, on the hill at Rephidim. So here you've got this 
this covenant, this careth bereth, this cutting of a serious covenant before God in the presence of the stone of Israel, God's witness, as it were. And they set it up there under not an oak, in the Hebrew it should read the oak. So what do you reckon this oak might be? Hey? Yeah, this is the one that Abraham came to. Oaks last a long, long time, hundreds and hundreds of years. Same oak, we believe, that Abraham came to in Shechem in Genesis 12, verses 6 and 7. The same oak under which Jacob got his family to bury the idols of the city of Shechem. Yes, it's that oak. And that's why it says at the end of verse 26, he set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Yahweh. Now, most literal translation, most translations say that was in the sanctuary of Yahweh. So why would it be the sanctuary of Yahweh? Well, because of what had happened there before. This was the place where Abraham came to. This was the place that Jacob made a covenant and demanded that they put away the strange gods from among them, just like Joshua was doing in exactly the same place. And the law of Moses, if you read this through this, where's reference to the law of Moses here? You don't find it. Why? Because you see it's pointing forward to the things that belong to Christ. The new covenant of grace would supersede the law. It's made and remembered in the sanctuary of Yahweh, the ecclesia. And then we read in verse 28, So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. So they had to go and take their own inheritance in that land. In other words, it's the same as you and me, brothers and sisters. We come to the memorial meeting, what for? To remind ourselves of the commitment that we made in baptism. To remind ourselves of the responsibilities that that we have to bear. To, To recommit to the task. To to take our inheritance, because there's only one individual that stands between me and my eternal inheritance in the kingdom, and he's sitting in front of you. Right? It's me. I'm the only one that's standing in my inheritance. My flesh. It's the only thing that can get in the way of an inheritance in the kingdom of God. So you've got to learn. Learn to do that every Sunday. to, To recommit. Use personal examination to recommit to the task ahead. But then we have something else. We have the death of Joshua in verse 29. Now, Joshua, Yahshua, Jesus, right? We know that Joshua is a magnificent type of Christ. So we should be looking for something here about our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look, you find it. Because we read in verse 29, And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died being 110 years old. It's the same age as Joseph, of course, isn't it? Interesting. Joseph the increaser. Jesus, the Greek for Joshua, was crucified as the salvation of God to increase the divine family. And that is, you know, sort of indicated in the type that we're seeing here. He's called Joshua the son of Nun. Nun actually means perpetuity. From the root to, to re-sprout, to to be perpetual. So it's a type of the resurrection of Christ because of his inheritance in God, his delegated authority to to bring life, perpetuity, eternal life. He's called the servant of Yahweh in that verse. It's a title of Christ as the divinely provided redeemer of mankind. And he's buried in a place, is Joshua, called Timnath Siri. See in verse 30? They buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. timnath Sirah means an abundant portion or a double portion. Is it, that, that becomes his inheritance. It's also called timnath Herez, or the portion of the sun, in Judges 2 and verse 9. So it points forward to our Lord Jesus Christ who would have his inheritance as a double portion, as as Yahweh's firstborn of a new creation, and of course as the son of righteousness, Malachi 4 verse 2. This is in Mount Ephraim, which means double fruit. It points to the development of spiritual Israel from both Jew and Gentile converts. And we'll say more about that in our next study, God willing, following, of course, the resurrection of Christ. And you notice it says the north side of the hill of Gaia. Why are all these details here, do you think? Well, the north side, the word means hidden, the hidden side of the hill Gaash, which means an earthquake. It points to Christ again. It's the fruit of Christ's work was to come on the other side, the hidden side, uh, in Joshua's day, 
of his death and resurrection, which were both attended by earthquakes, weren't they? His death and his resurrection attended by earthquakes. So Israel, we are told in verse 31, served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of God that he had done for Israel. Just like it was in the first century. The ecclesia prospered in the days of the apostles, but then, of course, as time went on and they died out, apostasy arose. So just one final thing about Joshua 24. I'm not sure, we're not going too badly for time. I'm going to get into Judges 9, I think. Um, I'm not going to keep you from lunch, but we'll, we'll have a look at Judges 9 quickly. Just one more thing here in Joshua 24. You, you've got to ask yourself, brothers and sisters, why God does certain things. Why, why does he put the record of the burial of Joseph's bones at the end of Joshua 24? Didn't they bury them when they came into the land? Did they have to wait until the death of Joshua? No. So why does he put it here? Well, we've already seen that Joshua is set forth as a type of Christ. Who's the other great type of Christ in Genesis? Joseph. The most complete type of Christ in the Bible. So it comes. His bones are buried at the end of the book of Joshua. And we want to have, just have a brief look at that. Because we read in verse 32, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground. It's got to be in Shechem, doesn't it? Which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So what's that about? Well, Joseph's name means the increaser. He was noted, of course, as the distributor of bread to save life and to save his father's family and indeed ultimately to save the world. Of course, it points forward to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. He continues to increase God's family by the bread of life after his death and resurrection. His inheritance was in Shechem, the burden bearer secured from Hamor. Hamor, or Hamor, is a, a name that means the male ass. Now, Kamor is the Hebrew word that refers to the male ass, and the male ass is the symbol of Israel. It's a symbol of the nation of Israel. So Christ as the burden bearer is the rightful heir of Israel's inheritance. And the price that was paid was a hundred pieces of silver. Now, silver is the biblical symbol for redemption. That's why they had to pay the half shekel of the sanctuary. But you see, my margin says, for this word pieces, it says lambs. Huh? What does that mean? Well, you see, it's actually a reference to the coins where a lamb was stamped on a silver coin. That's what it's referring to. So here is the lamb related to redemption. Yeah. Joseph the increaser, pointing forward to our Lord Jesus Christ as the lamb of God who paid the full price of redemption to secure inheritance for himself and for others. This, it says, became the inheritance of Ephraim, double fruit, and Manasseh, forgetting. And we're going to see in our next study that, that Ephraim and Manasseh are very important in the scheme of things. Manasseh represents the natural Jew living under law. His name means forgetting, as Israel forgot their God. And Ephraim means double fruit. It refers to Jew and Gentile of the true ecclesia in and under the Abrahamic promises. There's another little thing here. Did you notice what it said? It says, verse 32, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem. Now, we don't know exactly how heavy the casket was. But if you've ever been a pallbearer in a, in a funeral and had to carry a wooden box, you'll know it's not a light thing. You have to have half a dozen men normally, sometimes more, depending on the weight of those the, the person being buried, you have to have people that are devoted to carrying that coffin to its grave. They carried it from Egypt for 40 years until they buried it in the land. You think about that. The Apostle Paul picks this up in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10 when he says, we are always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. 
When I was baptised, I became a pallbearer in a sense. All right? I was like those men who in the wilderness, they couldn't carry their tent, they had to get someone else to do that. They had to carry the casket of Joseph all the way to the land. So do we, brothers and sisters. We've got to carry, as it were, the casket in the sense that we died with Christ in baptism. We're always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in us. That's why this is at the end of the book of Joshua. It's teaching us some very, very important lessons. Well, let's fulfil our desire to have a brief look at Judges chapter 9. Now, why am I, why am I going to take you to Judges 9? I want you to come and have a look at the words why I'm taking you here. Judges chapter 9. I want you to have a look with me verse, firstly at verse 16 of Judges 9 and then we'll come down to verse 19. And before I read those verses, I want you to just have a look with me at verse 6 of Judges 9 because it tells us where we are when these things are happening. Verse 6 says, And all the men of Shechem, that's where we are, Shechem, gathered together in all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain, it says. Now that's the word alone. By the oak of the pillar. Now hang on. The oak of the pillar. What pillar? The one that Joshua put there. The Eben stone, remember? He put an Eben stone under the oak that was in Shechem. Yeah. This is the sanctuary. This is like the Ecclesia. What's happening in the brotherhood? Well, you've got a son of Gideon who's going to become a type of the Pope. You know that? He becomes a type of the Pope. Yeah. Because his name happens to mean a father king, Abimelech. A father king. Yeah, just like the Pope thinks he is. I want to show you this. What we have here is an apostasy in Israel, just like it happened in the first, second, second century in the main, second and third centuries. An apostasy occurred when the elders that, that overlived Joshua or Jesus died out, when the apostles were gone. What happened to the ecclesia? There was an apostasy. And out of that came the Roman Catholic Church. Never forget, brothers and sisters, when you drive down the street and you see a Roman Catholic Church, they came out of us. Never forget that came out of the brotherhood. All right, And we don't want to go back there, do we? So this chapter is all about the rise, the development, the history, and the ultimate destruction of the Roman Catholic Church. When you've read through Judges in the past, and you come to chapter 9, you think, oh, what? Why all this? 57 verses? I mean, all these toings and froings? What's that in there for? He's not a faithful judge. No, it's there because it's telling you. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy of what was going to happen to the brotherhood when the apostles died out. Now, if you want more detail, I've got, I can give you a sheet on this, three or four page sheet on this, it will explain all of this in great... You're just going to get a, a brief summary. You've got a bit of a feel, you've been looking at that for a while. Bimelech, the son of Gideon, is a type of the rise, history and destruction of the papacy. And there are three segments to this. He goes from Judges 8.27 to 9.21 where you have the rise of the papacy in Abimelech. 22 to 49 is the history of papal ascendancy and it's so accurate, it's almost, it's awe-inspiring, the accuracy of it. In, in, even in timings, it's unbelievable. And in verses 50 to 57 you've got the destruction of the papacy, all prefigured in what happens here in this story about the rise of Abimelech. But you see, he, he kills off the 70 sons of Gideon. With his agreement with the men of Shechem, they hack the heads of the 70 sons of, of, of Gideon off. But one survives. His name is Jotham. And we come, we meet him. If you, if you read down in verse, uh, we'll come down to verse, um, where do I want to be? I want to read all of this. We go back, I think it's verse 7. 
And when they told it to Jotham, whose name means Yahweh is upright, and they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim. So what's Gerizim? Well, it's the Mount of Blessing, isn't it? He lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And he goes on with his speech. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. I want to come down to verse 16 and then verse 19. Verse 16, this is what he says. Now therefore, if ye have done truly, that's Emeth, and sincerely, that's Tamim. These are the two words used in Joshua 24 and verse 14. He's quoting it. If you've done sincerely and truly, you made Abimelech king. Come down to verse 19. If ye then have dealt truly, Emeth, and sincerely with Jeroboam or Gideon, and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. So what have we got here? Let's add it up. We've got them. He's at Shechem. He's on the Mount of Blessing, and he's cursing them. All right? He's shouting across the valley. He's cursing them, because they've killed off all of his brothers. And the whole house of Gideon, just like the, like the apostasy persecuted the true ecclesia, nearly destroyed it. All right? It's gone. And then you've got this long history of Abimelech. So let's just see if we can follow some of this. We're not going to go through all the detail. You know, the book of Judges is one of the most fantastic books of the Bible. It's all about the work of Christ, first and second advent. And you can teach every single element of the work of Christ without any other scripture, just from the book of Judges. It's all there. If you have a full record of a judge, he's always a type of Christ. So when you go through, you find Othniel, wonderful type of Ehud, Deborah and Barak, Gideon, Jephthah. They're all wonderful types of... Even Samson is a type of Christ. And you've got this guy, Abimelech. He's a type of the Roman Catholic system that emerged from the Brotherhood. There were 12 divinely appointed judges and one self-appointed. That makes 13. 13 is the number of... Guess where he comes in the scheme of things. Guess where what number Abimelech is of the judges. One, you got one guess. Yeah. Six. He's number six. That's not accidental, is it? Yeah. He sets forth the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. Self-appointed. Right? Makes up the number 13, rebellion. Six in the chronological order. Six is the number of men. Here is wisdom, says Revelation 13, verse 18. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So if you're going to choose two words to describe the apostasy that came out of the brotherhood, which ended up being the Roman Catholic Church, what would they be? Well, I know what the, what the scripture says they are. Right? Wealth and pride, yeah. You'd never, ever choose sincerity and truth. But when the public looks on Christadelphians, what two words would they use of our community, brothers and sisters? What should they be able to say about us? Sincerity, those people are very sincere. And if they find out what we believe, they'll say, and they got truth. <laughs> That's what it should be. And this is why, this is why you can't find sincerity and truth somewhere else. Because of the apostasy. So let's just go through it. Gideon's house was ensnared by an external form of worship. Remember how he got the gold? Made it into an ephod. Became a sin to Israel. The Roman church grew out of a Judaistic apostasy in Christ's house. Abimelech was born out of wedlock to a woman who was estranged from Gideon's house. And the man of sin was born out of fornication by the apostate ecclesia. Abimelech means a father king. The title papacy signifies papal government. Papa or pope means a father. The pope is a ruling father in the view of unenlightened men. Judges 9, 2 and 3. Abimelech's house made an alliance with the men of Shechem. Shechem's got to do with government. Responsibility. That's why it's used in Isaiah 9, verse 6. The government, the Shechem, that's the word, the Shechem shall be upon his shoulder. Yep. Well, the men of Shechem went into an alliance with Abimelech and they overthrew Gideon's house, Gideon the type of Christ. 
So the apostate church made an alliance with the state to assume control of the religious world and destroy the true ecclesia. So when the Christians joined with Constantine, remember that? 312 AD, that's where it took off. Verse 5, Abimelech slew his brethren. The apostate church persecuted to the death the true ecclesia. And verses 5 and 21, Jotham escaped and fled to Beer, a pit, and so the remnant of the true ecclesia found refuge in the wilderness. Revelation 12 and verse 6. That's all I'm going to say about it. There's too much detail. I'm going to take you to the end of the story. I want you to come to Judges chapter 9 and verse 53. Abimelech goes hard up against the tower of the city Thebes. Verse 53, it says, A certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all two break his skull. Piece of a millstone? Yeah. You know what it says in the Apocalypse? In Revelation 18, verse 21, And a mighty angel, read, the mighty rainbowed angel, read, the bride of Christ, a woman, took up a stone like a great millstone and cast into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And Abimelech comes to an end under a millstone. Yeah, he's a type of the papal system that's only 44 years away from destruction, brothers and sisters. That's what it is, 44 years away from destruction. 2060 will be its end. So who's going to be there? Who's going to be there to deal with that power, do you think? I think I know. They have certain characteristics. They put away the strange gods from among them. And they serve God in sincerity and truth.